Welcome adventurers, what's going on guys? My name is Cody, this is Taking 20, a channel about all things role-playing games, and I want to welcome you back to Wrath and Glory Week here on the channel. All week we've been talking about the new Wrath and Glory Warhammer 40k RPG by Ulysses North America, so if you have missed any of the videos and you want to catch up, you can find links to all the videos down in the description box below. Today we're taking a deep dive into the non-Imperium archetypes or classes in Wrath and Glory, including the Renegades, the Scum, the Orc, and the Eldar. Let's jump into this thing. Okay, let's finish up with the two remaining human factions that we didn't cover in yesterday's video on the Imperium archetypes, the Scum and the Renegades. The Scum are less a true faction and more a loose gathering of people who, for one reason or another, are outsiders here in the Imperium. Their lives are hard and difficult, and they spend their lives focused on survival, not to uphold some Imperial creed that they don't give a damn about. Any day could be their last, and for these people, the biggest threat to them comes not from the terrible daemons or orcs or tyranid invasions, but rather from their own government that would just as soon execute them in the streets for some insane violation or impress them into servitude. Servitude that would all but guarantee their ultimate demise anyways. For the most part, choosing an archetype belonging to the scum will give players an incredible amount of freedom in what type of character that they want to roleplay. Scum can be street gangers, local heroes, or they can even try to join other organizations like the Adeptus Ministorum, for example, without falling prey to the delusions of their teachings, but rather just because they'll get three square meals a day. Let's take a look at the first archetype under the scum umbrella, the ganger. Ganger is the term given to the many peoples across the galaxy that understand that there are strengths in numbers and that by working together in a tight knit community, they can achieve a much better life than they could on their own. On sparsely low technologically advanced planets, these gangers, well, they're called tribes. On tech heavy, densely populated planets, they're called street gangs. The life of a ganger is one of constant strife. Whether they are competing with other gangers over resources or trying to invade any Imperium forces in order to prevent unwanted attention on themselves, gangers are on constant alert. Typically, gangers will wear some sort of signifying mark to establish themselves as belonging to their particular gang, and initiation into a gang or a tribe varies from the very violent to simple acknowledgement that the addition of a new recruit will be to the benefit of the entire group. Ganger has a tier requirement of just one, and it gives a small boost to influence and a special ability called Scrounger, which gives them a further boost to cunning tests and lets them retroactively add a rank bonus to influence tests. After that, we have the wretched and practically inhuman Scabby. Scabbies live in the most inhospitable areas imaginable, either by choice or, as is most common, by necessity. Rad wastes, toxic swamps, and contaminated maintenance shafts are just some of the places one might encounter a Scabby. And the effects of their contaminated environments have taken their tolls on its denizens, often causing mutations amongst scabbies to the point where one might question if scabbies could still be considered human at all. Food and resources are extremely scarce in these places, causing scabbies to often turn to cannibalism. Anything that might be safely eaten is eaten, mold, waste, and flesh included. Procreation in these dismal environments is difficult, and any offspring that are managed are often more twisted than their parents, a result of both their toxic exposure and just from the inbreeding. Scavings surprisingly have a tier requirement of at least two, and they take a small penalty to influence, and they gain access to Mutant, an ability that allows them to take on several mutations for their character, one at the start of the game, and an additional mutation whenever they gain a rank. And the last of the scum is the Desperado, the free spirit opportunist who chooses to live a life outside of what the Imperium provides. Fiercely independent, the Desperado has no desire to accept the authority over their lives that the Imperium imparts on their citizens in exchange for food and shelter. 
Desperados do not buy into the system, and as such, they don't contribute to the Imperium, nor do they really rely on it. Due to their independence, Desperados are skillful in many things, really out of necessity if nothing else, and they understand how to leverage those skills through a mutually beneficial agreement with others, including the occasional Inquisitor should a lucrative opportunity present itself. And because of this, few Desperados actually live in absolute poverty with instead a significant portion carving out a rather affluent life for themselves. Desperado has a tier requirement of three and starts the game with an ability called Valuable Prey, which gives the Desperado a rank to both cunning tests and to awareness tests when tracking a target. Next up, we have the final human faction in Wrath and Glory, the Renegades. The harsh truth of the Imperium is that it is a totalitarian government. And for those that turn away from the Imperium, whether through desire for freedom or because they believe it to simply be ineffective, they all eventually hear the call of corruption. First up, we have the cultist. Cultists exist in many forms. Your childhood friend, your neighbor, your barber, and even those in positions of power could secretly be cultists, hiding their secret markings and brandings behind layers of clothing. Stockpiling weapons they acquire during precise raids, they lie in wait for an opportunity to don their costumes and gather together to strike out in the streets against those still loyal to the Emperor. Cultist is available as early as Tier 1 and picks up a beefy influence bonus as well as the From Within ability, which gives them a rank bonus to deception tests made against characters with the Imperium keyword. After that, we have the fallen tech priest, the heretic. But first, I want to give a huge shout out to Miniature Market for helping me put together Wrath and Glory Week here on the channel. Simply put, I love Miniature Market and I personally can recommend them to gamers as I have been a longtime customer myself. Guys, Miniature Market carries an insane amount of games from tabletop role playing games to Dungeons and Dragons minis, limited edition RPG covers, DM screens, dice, and more. And they already have every single Wrath and Glory product available at a discount for their customers even during their pre-order. I'll throw a link down in the description box below for you guys to go and check them out for yourselves. And by the way, that link will let Miniature Market know that I sent you over, so it's a great way to help out the channel. To create an unliving creation with a conscious mind is to break sacred laws of the Adeptus Mechanicus, but some tech priests attempt to work around these tenets by summoning spirits from the warp to control their creations, fusing them together in unholy daemon monstrosities. And while many laws are in place to prevent such corruption, still some tech priests, whether they are well-intentioned or not, choose to delve deep into the study and application of Xenotech and Archaeotech, and these members of the Dark Mechanicus are known as heretics. Heretics have a requirement of tier 2 before they become available and naturally pick up a bonus to corruption as well as an ability called transformative technology which automatically reduces the time it takes for them to perform a tech test and gives them a rank bonus for tech interaction attacks. And then we have the rogue psychers. As we talked about in yesterday's video, psychers in the Imperium are expected to be reported and then sent off to the black ships where they await their judgment, should they be allowed to survive and eventually become a sanctioned psyker. For rogue psychers, they might be those who were fortunate enough that their family hid their powers from the Imperium, or even those who might have escaped their overseer while waiting for the black ships and now harness a hatred for the Imperium due to either their fear of what might happen to them if they were caught or because of the harrowing experiences that they've already endured. Still, other rogue psychers might wish to live on the outskirts of humanity, thinking their power safe and controlled far, far away from the rest of the Imperium. But what they don't realize is that their psychic abilities are an unchecked gateway to any and all beings that spawn in the warp, which almost always 
leads them down the path of chaos. Rogue Psyker has a tier requirement of two, picks up a bonus to corruption as you imagine, and much like the sanctioned Psyker, gains the Psyker ability, starting the game with the smite power, and they have the ability to access additional psychic powers subject to tier restrictions. And real quick, as an added note, the last archetype for the Renegades is the Chaos Space Marine. While this archetype is really technically optional in the book at the GM's discretion, the class functions identical to the Adeptus Astartus archetypes with additional corruption and of course the Chaos and Heretic Astartus keywords. Okay, now let's jump over to the non-human factions in Wrath and Glory, the Eldar and the Orcs. For both of these factions, their respective races play a larger part in what the faction actually is, and they are far less fragmented than the humans and the Imperium of Man. As such, I won't be going into too much depth here, as most of this information was touched on in the Wrath and Glory Species Guide that I did earlier this week, which I'll throw a link up there, and I'll put another link down in the description box below if you guys want to catch up with that particular video. The Eldar are a psychically sensitive race, experiencing emotions on a scale that humans really have a hard time truly understanding. And because this sensitivity once caused the ultimate downfall of their race, it's a common practice for an Eldar to seek solitude from time to time in order to reaffirm their perspective for their duties as a contributing member of their individual societies. The Eldar currently fall into one of two groups, the Outcasts and Corsairs, who live on the fringes of the galaxy on planets called Maiden Worlds, where they escape to prior to the fall of the Eldari Empire, and the Inari, who live on great void ships called Craft Worlds, who similarly made their exit from the Eldari Empire prior to its fall. Okay, let's start with the Corsair. The Corsair is in essence a free-willed pirate, traveling across the galaxy on small vessels at their own whims, and they are ironically much more akin to their Eldari ancestors in their pursuit of their own desires than the Yanari. Typically gathering in Corsair cotteries or small fleets to serve a Corsair prince or princess, these Eldar tend to be a bit more aggressive and opportunistic than their brethren. Operating in small bands, a Corsair relies on its ship's maneuverability to outlast cargo vessels, where it will seize an opportunity to board and then plunder, where they exhibit an extraordinary savagery. The Corsair is available to select as early as Tier 1 and picks up an ability called Dancing on the Blade's Edge, which allows them to select either the Athletics or Persuasion interaction attack and gain a rank bonus to it, but they also suffer a plus 1 to any difficulty number on any fear test that they make. Then we have the Eldar Ranger, those who have left their craft worlds in pursuit of solidarity. Though they live their lives in seclusion, they ever remain loyal and vigilant for any threat that they might come across or hear about to their originating craft world. Rangers are driven by wanderlust and are quite capable warriors, relying on stealth and marksmanship whenever they are called into battle. The Ranger has a build cost of 30 and requires you to be at least tier two before it becomes available to select, and they pick up an ability called From the Shadows, which makes them more difficult to detect and attack whenever they are behind cover. And the last Eldar archetype is the Warlock. Warlocks are those Eldar who choose to pursue their psychic abilities even further, honing them through years of training, risking exposure to the warp in the process. While Warlocks are devastating foes on their own, part of their training includes learning how to complement fellow Warlocks to further bolster their capabilities, and Warlocks live for this thrill of battle. In their training and focus, Warlocks also develop an aptitude to receive precognitive visions, though they must remain vigilant in sussing out the truth of these visions, as the many terrible daemons of the warp often use false visions to lure psychic sensitive warriors into deadly traps. The Warlock has a tier requirement of three, and along with their influence boost, they pick up Runes of Battle, which functions much like the Psyker ability, with added benefits that the Warlock can also gain additional psychic abilities called Runes of Battle, go figure, like Horrify, subject to tier restrictions, of course. 
And finally, we have the orcs and their archetypes, the orc boy, the orc commando, and the orc knob. I covered a lot on orcs in the species video I did, and truthfully, there isn't much more to add here in their motivations as a whole. The short version is, orcs were created for the purpose of war, and they stop at nothing to pursue it. First up, we have the Orc Boy. The Orc Boy makes up the majority of the Orc forces, and they are every bit as full of gusto and battle lust as you might expect. Led by the biggest and strongest Orc Boy, these mobs are riddled with infighting and chaos if a more clear foe isn't present. Though, if a knob has given instructions to an Orc Boy, they are expected to follow it, lest they face extreme consequences. The Orc Boy has no build point cost and can be selected as early as tier one and picks up an ability called Get Stuck In that gives the boy a rank bonus to melee attacks for every single ally engaged in melee combat with their target. The Orc Commando is in a small way the antithesis of the Orc Boy, where Orc Boys get the thrill out of the big loud gun and charge headfirst into battle to their own detriment oftentimes, Orc commandos instead use every trick and dirty tactic that they can think of when waging war. Lying in wait, they fight a far more cunning way than do the orc boys, even serving as a distraction at times to pull an enemy farther into battle than might be wise. Commandos are quick to exploit any weakness in their foes that they can find. Sabotaging supply lines, infiltrating an enemy transport, and unleashing devastating explosives, orc commandos can have far bigger impacts on the overall outcome of a battle than their numerous orc boy brethren. Orc commando is available at tier two, and they pick up the ability Cun and Plan, which grants orc allies within 15 meters a bonus to stealth checks. And last, but certainly not least, we have the Orc Knob. The Orc Knob answers only to an Orc War Boss and is in charge of their entire Orc Mob. Orc Knobs must lead by example, and of course are the biggest and strongest of the Orcs within the overall mob. They are entirely responsible for their mob, and should they lead their mob into defeat or even take too many casualties during a successful mission, they know that they will be held accountable by the Orc War Boss. This causes Orc Knobs to be very hands-on in their approach, beating or inspiring their boys to compliance and success. They have no qualms about throwing themselves into the throes of battle, as any injury sustained in battle will surely be better than the ones to come should they fail. The Orc Knob is available by tier three and has a build point cost of 60 and picks up the special ability called simply Boys, which grants the Knob a troop of boys to command equal to their rank times three. Once again, I want to thank Miniature Market for helping me bring Wrath and Glory Week here to the channel. And I want to give a huge shout out to all you kick-ass patrons out there over at welcomeadventures.com. I see you. I appreciate it. If you enjoyed this video, you want to support more content like this while grabbing some exclusive rewards for yourself, welcomeadventures.com is a great way to support the channel. If this is your first time here and you love role-playing games as much as I do, I'd love to have you subscribe. Every week I put out new videos on G GM tips, player tips, tutorials, and more. So if that sounds like something you might be interested in, just hit the subscribe button down below and come join us. Thank you guys so much for watching. My name is Cody and may your games be filled with awesome memories and even better friends. I'll catch you guys next time. Yeah.